Well, very clearly a problem that our country faces. Thank you. And I, I don't know how we're going to uh, solve it un any more than you do unless the people rise up. And I think that's something what all of us need to leave here thinking about. Because maybe the only way we can change this is to have a constitutional convention and that the state legislature, legislators are, in, are going to have to vote to have a constitutional convention. Because the very rich who control and give all the money, as you outlined very well, um, is a very, very small percentage of the people who contributed money in the last campaign, 0.00003% gave 62% of the money. Right. I, they're not going to elect Congress, or Congress is not going to change it, unless we change it from below, and I commend you for doing what you're doing, and I, I hope that maybe we can get a constitutional convention and either limit the amount of money that can be given to any candidate, or the amount of money spent in the campaign, if it was when Senator Holland said, or maybe limit terms. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You should know, speaking of that, people ask you, well, what can I do, and so forth. You should know that right now in New Hampshire, you, of course, you have a great institution, which is village meetings, town meetings. And there are people now in many New Hampshire towns circulating petitions calling for exactly what you said, calling for a constitutional amendment to roll back the Citizens United decision, empowering Congress to regulate campaign, full disclosure uh, of, of all campaign donations, uh, because at the moment now they're getting to be more and more secret donations that you can't track. So there are things being done, and, and, and you actually have a unique opportunity here and next door in Vermont where the tradition of town meetings is very common. You can actually go in your town and take part in a town meeting, sign a, met, sign a petition, that kind of stuff. So uh, look around where you live, uh, you know, here in Portsmouth, I think, I, I forget, Portsmouth may be a larger town where you don't have a town meeting anymore, is that right? <laughs> or, but over in Exeter, they have them, and uh, over in Stratum, they have them, and over in Hampton, they have them, and so forth. Uh, but so there's something people can do in this state uh, with immediate impact. Thank you for your comments. I, I agree with your comments regarding the way the tax structure is going, and how it's creating homes and bifurcated society. I, I guess my question would be around the late 1978's time frame. Since then, you said the income for middle class has been flatlined. Right. How much do you contribute that to just the, work, the globalization of the economy? And in the old days, where an unskilled or low skilled worker could get by and have a you know, decent living, where now with globalization, those jobs and those opportunities mm -hmm. are going to increase. Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question, uh, because that's sort of what I thought when I started out working on this book, that what I'm looking at here, the change from the 70s, 60s, and 50s to today, is really driven, and I heard this from a lot of people, is really driven by globalization and modern technology and impersonal market forces, and it's not a matter of decisions and polit politics in Washington, or maybe a little bit, but not much. And I thought that for quite a while until somebody said, why don't you take a look at other countries? Because if it's in fact globalization and technology, we should see the structure of the economy in America mirrored in other advanced economies. I mean, Germany should look pretty much like ours and France and, and Australia and Canada and so on, and they don't. We have an, ex I just told you, Citibank said we have the most extreme inequalities in 500 years. So if the others are close, well, the others aren't close. There's a thing the economy, economists call the Gini coefficient, and it's a, it's a formula that measures inequality of income. Uh, and if you had only one, per, if Bill Gates or Warren Buffett owned everything, we'd have a score of 100, 1.00, okay? And if everybody had exactly the same money, we'd have a score of 0.00. .00. So if you're somewhere in between, it indicates we have the highest Gini coefficient of any advanced economy by far. So we have much greater inequality. So if it's just these impersonal forces, we should have a figure that's somewhere close to the others. But more importantly, if you take a look at a country like Germany, they've done what we've been told we couldn't do in conditions of globalization. They have raised wages five times faster in the last 25 years, on average, than American companies have. Now, American companies have told us they cannot raise wages and still be globally competitive. That's globalization, right? The Germans, companies, if you look at Bayer, Siemens, Daimler-Benz, Airbus, companies like that, they have raised
raise the wages of median workers. The same, and by the way, German workers now make more than American workers, and they work fewer hours a year, and they have more benefits. Okay? So if that's the reason why American companies would be not competitive, then we should expect to see Siemens and Bayer and all those companies, Airbus, out of business, and they're not. More importantly, if you think about how the countries compete globally, from 2000 to 2010, the United States had a $6 trillion trade deficit. We bought $6 trillion more stuff from the world than we sold. That's why we had these wages frozen, right? The Germans were raising wages, and they had a $2 trillion trade surplus. They exported $2 trillion more to the world. Something's wrong here. Something's wrong with the logic. If they're raising wages faster, they should have a bigger trade deficit than we do, if wages are the problem. Okay? Now, the next thing we were told was that we had to be modern in the 21st century, and that meant moving to a service economy. The manufacturing was dead. The manufacturing was going the same way that farming did. We used to have a lot of people in farming. I mean, our farms got more efficient. But we could feed our nation with 10% of the people working in farming, and then 8%, and then 6%, and then 4%. Now I think we're down to 2.3%. Farming's dead. So they said manufacturing is going the same way. Get into banking, get into service, get into hotels, whatever you do, get into service. Okay? Well, the Germans said, no, we don't believe that. We think manufacturing is important. We think it's the core of a modern economy, and we think those are the best jobs uh, to hang on to. High tech, high wage jobs will produce a high standard of living. And so they did everything they could to hang on to high tech jobs at home and manufacturing at home. And if you look at us today, we have about 9% of our workforce in manufacturing. And Germany has 21% of its workforce in manufacturing. And at the beginning of the 2000 decade, we had about 19%. So we lost about 10% of our workforce in manufacturing in that one 10 or 12 year period. And at the same time, Germany competed effectively globally, high wages, and kept the manufacturing job. Manufacturing jobs are enormously important, not just for those jobs. And don't picture them now. We were talking about, uh, Dr. Gattel was talking about advanced manufacturing. It's highly technical. It's highly computerized. It's not the old-fashioned, unskilled worker, toss something on the car, screw the bolts on the assembly line, put on the wheel, whatever it is. It's much more complicated than that. But the important thing is, it's not just those jobs. Every one of those jobs requires designers and engineers to design and, and, and engineer those products. It requires a sales force to market it. It requires executives to oversee it. And then in all those towns, there are real estate agents, and there, there are car dealerships, and there's a 3.5 multi effect economists tell us for every manufacturing job so if you hang on to a million manufacturing jobs you've just hung on to four and a half million jobs for your economy that's pretty important and the Germans have been smart about that now the way they do that is with much more close collaboration between management and labor what happens when 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 and I talked to the CEO Klaus Kleinfeld of, of Siemens uh, which is a German electronic company and he's now the head CEO of Alcoa an American company I talked to him about it, and he said one of the things we do is we, we collaborate. At Siemens, we decided at one point we were making an old-fashioned mechanical engine, and it was no longer the best engine you could build, and we could actually build that engine for about 15% less in Czechoslovakia, which is not that far away from Germany, so the transport costs are not very big. So we decided we had to design a new digital engine that we could make in Germany. And management and labor sat down and said, how are we going to do this? And management said to labor, the trade unions, your guys don't know digital uh, electronics. They know analog electronics. They're not trained. They don't have a Great Bay Community College training them, right? And the labor people said, well, yeah, you're right.